Well, I'm really, really pleased this morning to be joined here in the Forest of Dean, on the edge of Wales, still in medium risk here, medium. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry to hear about London being being, um, We're being elevated to high, but I'm joined by Johnny Howard, and Johnny needs no introduction. He is the bass with the King Singers and has been now for an amazing 10 years, a whole decade. And um, I thought it was about time we got together and had a little chat. And I'm sure a lot of our, our followers and friends on, on IAS will, will love to hear from you directly. And um, so welcome, Johnny. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to talk to you on a Sunday. Here, yeah, yeah, here, in, here in High Risk West London, um, it's, it's funny. I, the only real difference I notice now is that I can't go inside a restaurant. Otherwise, my life is pretty, pretty much the same um, as it has been for the last three months. But I can't go inside a restaurant with friends. So I have to just yeah. be very good in, in my own company with, with other people with, uh, sort of when I'm eating. But apart from that, we're fine. Yeah. I think. So don't worry about me too much. Well, keeping keeping uh, fingers crossed for you all over there. My, we have five children between us, um, Rachel and I, and and they're all living and working in London in in kind of this semi lockdown measure. So, really feel for you guys. Okay, so right back to the beginning, pre KS, Johnny, tell us a little bit how things were for you before the King Singers came along. What you were doing your whole musical background, the whole thing. Uh, okay. Uh, I think music's been a really key part of my life, my whole life, but I, I have a slightly different path to many of my other colleagues to being at the King Singers. I, I sort of first fell in love with music probably when I was about three and my parents gave me a Kitty Craft cassette recorder. I'm sure you remember those. It just had like play, pause, stop, rewind, fast forward. Mm -hmm. It was white and it had a handle. And uh, my parents are very active in the church where we lived in Southwest London in a place called New Malden, which apparently has more Koreans than anywhere else outside Korea in the world. Uh, and I think that's still true. Um, yeah, there were about 18 Korean supermarkets on the high street there. Um, they um, were very active in the church there and bought me lots and lots of tapes of hymns, Mission Praise, Junior Praise, and I memorized them for fun. So from about the age of four, I memorized hymns. Um, and had learned to read music very early because our next door neighbor was a piano teacher who was also my child mind there when my parents were working full time. So I learned the piano very young and definitely to read music very, very young. And I, I just sang these hymns absolutely everywhere. That then translated into pop music um, and also community choirs. I was never a chorister in a cathedral or a church, but I was in the local um, community choir called the Horsham Children's Choir where we moved down to Sussex. Um, interestingly, um, the director initially was a guy called Peter Orwood, so Ralph Orwood's brother, um, so a big choral dynasty. And then when he went on sabbatical, a man called Alexander Lestrange, who's arranged so many things for the King Singers over the mm -hmm. past decade, and I think before, um, took over and he gave me my first ever solo in a choir. I was a very fat nine-year-old and I was in the back row because I was quite tall, the Horsham Children's Choir, and I had to step out solo at the front of the concert in St Mary's Church in Horsham singing the opening songs from No Stri the opening solo, sorry, from No Strings and No Connections by I think Fred Astaire. And that was my first foray into kind of the spotlight. Uh, but I, I just sang and I played the piano all the time at home. I then I went to a, the German school in London for three years until I was eight. So I, my, my grandmother was Austrian and lots of people on my mother's side of the family were German. So they thought it would be good if I spoke. German as well. Um, but then I moved to a state primary school and we moved down to Sussex and learned the violin in one of those hilarious kind of county council peripatetic violin lesson things where there are five of you learning to play a G major scale uh, in one room for 15 minutes on a Tuesday. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, so that was also something I was very keen on. And then when I was 11, I went to the school my father taught at called Christ Hospital in Sussex, which has the most Harry Potter-esque uniform in the world, I believe. Uh, and there I, I sang in the, I sang in the chapel choir briefly as a treble and then I thought I was overcommitted, so I stopped. And then only really started singing chorally when I was 15. And the, the chapel choir is enormous at Christ Hospital. It's about 160 people mm. and lots of very cool people, particularly in the years above, were in it. So I thought, okay, this is a way of kind of climbing the social ladder. Um, yeah. 
And it's Johnny, we, those, quite good today. Johnny, we should tell people, do Google Christ Hospital because the, the uniform is quite extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. it's the original uniform that um, was uh, kind of uh, part of the, the fabric of the school when it was founded in 1552 in London. Um, and it was set up as one of three institutions um, to help the kind of destitute children of London. Well, I think no, there were three. There was one, I think St. Thomas's was set up for the, uh, for the infirm. There was Brideswell, I think, was set up for the, the mentally unstable mm -hmm. or infirm. And then Christ Hospital was set up as an educational establishment for the destitute. And um, it's one of the richest schools in the country because it owns this enormous tract of land, I think, still in the middle of the city. So there's a big plaque mm -hmm. next to what is now the bank Merrill Lynch um, or kind of um, sculpture there to commemorate the site. And you can see kind of this was Christ Hospital and lots of plaques on walls. Um, as a consequence, 40% of pupils pay nothing. Um, uh, which is really interesting. So the social demographic makeup is, is yeah. really funny um, for, a, for a private school in the UK and only about, I think, 5% pay full fees. So it's, mm. it's, a, it's a really interesting mix. The uniform uh, is, just to quickly describe it, a long black woolen coat to the floor um, with kind of white bands, so two white sort of rectangles coming down here like a priest, um, a collarless white shirt, black breeches, so kind of trousers to just below the knee, and then yellow socks to above the knee. And the yellow socks were yellow because they were initially made of saffron dye to scare away the rats in London. And, and, wow. and like, all of this, all of this is just stuff, <laughs> which is great. And then if you were, if you were a prefect, as I was in your last year, you get a wonderful thing where you start, you get, I think, a silk lining to your jacket, and you also then get velvet cuffs and a velvet collar, which is very comfortable, and lots of buttons down your front. Oh. Um, it, it, the uniform is sensationally weird and i i'm so grateful for it and also they they have kind of referenda every five years to see whether the pupils want to keep the uniform and they always say yes they always wow. say yes i'm sorry i interrupted your flow you were just about to tell us about oh, no. your, co your coralizing uh, yeah a, well as... no it was it was literally only when i was about I, I played i played everything so i was i played the violin the viola and the piano and i mm. i did some orchestral percussion was a drummer in the school marching band that this the school marches into an 150 marched into lunch every day to an 150 piece marching band it's sort of wow. mad anyway um i did that as well and then when i was i think either either just still 14 or 15 i joined the chapel choir and i was i think quite good at it my voice had broken i sort of didn't suffer any of these tragedies of your voice breaking because i and my identity wasn't bound up with being a treble so i just i was mm. sort of quite happy that my voice broke when i was about 13. um but it sort of went down slowly. So I was a, mm -hmm. I think I was always a bass, but I was sort of a, a high, a high bass baritone for a very long time. Uh, and yeah, sang at the, sang at the chapel quite very happily. Uh, and this is a terrible admission, isn't it? But I, uh, I was, I, I was so, I was so eager to please and be, um, not necessarily the best, but among the best at school that like I set my sights on going to Oxbridge. Um, and, I didn't really care what subject I studied. I just wanted to get in. I sort of did a very weird mix of subjects for, for A-levels. And, and I remember speaking to the director of music and they said, well, if you, if you get in with a choral scholarship, it often means that they sort of, they find a place for you if you're academically good enough. You have to compete mm. against the other people in the same way. Um, because I, I think for Cambridge, you do all the admissions earlier. And for Oxford, I think as a choral scholar, they can, they can make a place for you if you're good enough and then you, sat, you satisfy them academically so I thought right okay I'll, I'll apply for a course scholarship that sounds like a good idea um and I got into new college in Oxford and I really I mean I, I've said this many times to the guy who was the call director at the time he's an amazing man called Ed Higginbottom and I, I told him very often for about my first two to two and a half years I hated it um I just thought that there was this magical kind of golden two hours period of two hours every day between five and seven where everyone else was having the best time in Oxford and I was mm. stuck in the chapel. And I, because I hadn't been a chorister, I, I sort of, it wasn't a rhythm or a ritual that I particularly cared for at the time. I just thought, like, you're interrupting my life. Um, mm -hmm. And then I had a, there was a pivot about halfway through my third year. And I was there for four years because classics is a four-year course. I eventually decided that, of course, I'll study Latin and ancient Greek. For anyone, for anyone in doubt, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting degree. It's not necessarily that useful, although I probably do read more Latin than most people <laughs> in my current job as uh, singing choral <laughs> music. Um, but yeah, about halfway through my third year, I, 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 one, I think I got better. Two, my voice got a lot lower. Um, I don't really know how that happens. I don't know if the same thing happened to you where suddenly it just got lower again. Yeah. And mm. for like a second break. And um, 
uh, yeah, I, I, I suddenly really enjoyed the uh, the sense of belonging to something mm. that was that was that was meaningful. Um, yeah, and so I, I, I loved it. Um, I was encouraged to go and be a professional singer by Edward, the, the choir director, and I thought that sounds a bit too much like hard work. So mm. I, I, I graduated. Um, but I hadn't done any kind of internships for any jobs because we had tours every summer and everything. So I thought I can't, I can't um, kind of commit 10 weeks in the summer to say working at a bank or a management consultancy because I'd always have to interrupt mm. it to go, and, to go and tour or record. So I left without kind of a job at all with a, with a very respectable degree, but nothing kind of nothing else waiting for me. So I, I put myself on some yeah. debt list in London. So I sang, um, I sang kind of occasionally at Westminster Abbey and I had a, I had a, a lay clerkship at the Chapel Royal at Hampton Court for a while and worked in advertising. Um, and I worked on Belgrave Square for pittance. I had to, I remember this very clearly. My, my lunch used to be, I used to go to the Waitrose on Mockham Street, which it won't mean a lot to many people, but Mockham mm -hmm. Street is probably the most expensive street <laughs> in the whole of London. It, it kind of has only the most shishi eateries and kind of dry cleaners that charge you 15 pounds per garment and a Waitrose, which is a, I'm sure most of you will know, is a, is a kind of a high-end English supermarket. Yeah. And I used to go in and I would buy, I would buy six pita breads and two tubs of sandwich filler. So, you know, kind of either coronation chicken or tuna sweet corn or something. They would, all the, all the, the basics ones. So that cost about one pound 80. Um, and that would be lunch for two days. And I would walk to and from uh, work from Clapham Junction where I was living to not spend money on public transport. I earned something, I think my, my starting salary living in London and I was paying rent was something like 12,000 pounds. It was extraordinary. And I thought, how on earth yeah. am I going to, wow. how on earth am I going to survive? And so I, I, I sort of then graduated into a couple of different jobs. I worked for a different agency and earned slightly more normal money. But mm -hmm. I remember very clearly when, when I was contacted to, um, to be asked if I wanted to audition for the King Singers, I thought like, this is an extra, this would be an extraordinary change mm -hmm. of pace and direction. But it did, it did come completely out of the blue because mm. I, I sort of, my whole life, I don't even have a GCSE in music, which is, so I don't have a single academic official qualification in music at all. And, mm. and that was sort of intentional because I, I always wanted music to be my hobby, my, my love. Mm. I didn't ever want it to become a grind or something I resented. So it was, it was extraordinary when suddenly, suddenly I got this mm. call and I thought, okay, maybe this, maybe this will be my life. Um, it's interesting because it no. that that kind of just floating just above poverty um, was was somewhere I, I can appreciate that because just before being fi finding that there was a possibility to to audition with the King Singers, I was kind of you know eking out an overdraft. Um, and for those who don't know, that's when you're in in very much in the red. And in the, you owe the bank money, and uh, I was having meals that consisted of, you know, noodles and margarine, you know, and those kind of strange yeah. things and tinned meatballs and things like I that. Love it. Um, and I, I don't know for you. I, I, I had no expectation, and that that there was ever going to be a chance that I would I would get this job. But, but it was just such a a thing that you couldn't turn down because because the, the group had such a profile. It was. It was just a bit of a dream to even go along and have an audition. So tell us a little bit about your experience, the whole well, I audition thing. Well, I imagine we're probably quite similar in this regard because we were both so young when we started. Um, mm. You think you were 21, weren't you? And mm -hmm. I, I, was, I, I had um, just turned 23. Um, and I think what was, yeah, very interesting, when, when I was auditioning, no one had a clue who I was. Um, at all, like I, the, I've, I've never met anyone of the group. I've never sung with anyone of the group. And I only had one recommendation, uh, which was from Edward Higginbottom, uh, which is lovely. And I, I subsequently learned that one of the reasons that was quite valuable is because I don't think he'd ever recommended anyone else ever. So it's like, oh, okay, we'll listen to this one because, <laughs> because he doesn't send us 15 names every time we ask him. Um, I, I think what was good about that is that there was no pressure on me to, to be good. Um, and I think what, one other thing which I quite enjoyed, um, there's no reason you should remember this, but I, I was the first person to audition both in both rounds of auditions. So in the first round and the second round, no one had gone before me. So I remember mm -hmm. walking in and there's no kind of, we're comparing you to this other person. 
So, and I knew, I knew that because I knew I was the first person in both rounds. I've been joking with Carolyn, who was our then administrator about it. And um, what, was, what was great, therefore, was that, I, I mean, I thought the audition, the auditions went fine. I didn't, I didn't think they went badly at all. I couldn't say they went really well, but I wasn't sort of asked to do anything again because I got it wrong. Um, mm. It's like, try this, try this, how about this, see what you think. Um, and, and that's great. Um, but I remember leaving thinking that, well, that was, that was great. I've done myself justice, I think. Uh, and uh, yeah, no one else in my advertising agency will have done an audition for the King's Fingers today. So that's really fun. <laughs> mm. um, I think what's, what's strange about the process is that a lot of the times, I mean, I think for any other audition I've ever done, it had been the preparation of a solo aria or something. And I remember joking with a friend now, um, I didn't really know him at the time. He was just, he'd been deafening at Hampton Court as well, who'd auditioned for Tim Wainwright's job. So the second alto job, the, the, the last job to come up before mine. And I'd said, I'd, I'd got this email and I said, oh, I'm just thinking about preparing these pieces for audition. They're like, no, 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 that's not how it works. You'll just, you'll get an email, <laughs> you'll get an email and it'll contain some PDFs and you've got to learn them in like two weeks. And I said, like, okay, that's fine. That's fine. That actually makes it a lot easier for me because I don't have to think about like rehearsing with a pianist or, <laughs> or learning something that, you know, will differentiate me from other people. We're all going to get the same stuff. Um, but yeah, you, you, you walk into this audition, you've got five people, I mean, for me, whom I didn't know at all. Um, and it's, it's very fun because if, if you are, I think, competent in your, or not confident in your ability, both to sight read and also not to get thrown by seeing with new people, it's mm. just like playing a really fun musical jigsaw puzzle where you just kind of just slot yourself into what's going on around you very quickly. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's great fun i mean like for someone like me who enjoys who enjoys a, a challenge like that i i had a really good time and, and you're, made... you're so right about this sorry to interrupt but you're no, so right about this this idea of going along to something like that where there's no expectations from 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 them off off or from you to because um this, you, you know you're not number one favorite or you, you're, you're coming from being a complete unknown character and actually you can enjoy the process a little bit more. I think it's interesting because if I look at the, the five people that I've now kind yeah. of been part of the recruitment process for, I think two were the out and out favorites. Like everyone, everyone thought that they'd be the person to get the job and they were the person to get the job. Mm -hmm. um, one person had a very roundabout, I'm not going to say who these people are because that's their <laughs> game. Sure, yeah. one, person had, one person actually declined to audition the first time. And then we had a, a whole farrago with someone whom we chose and then they pulled out and then we had to find someone else and then they were interested again and now they're there. So it, it's sort of a very weird audition process. And then the other two people were completely unheard of again, like completely mm. unheard of. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's very interesting because there's... It, everyone's very proficient but actually i think that to 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 have your slightly own like your own sort of set of criteria that don't necessarily overlap with what everyone in london is booking you know like it, it would if, if it was if it was that you always went for the person that there was sort of the most highly regarded on the circuit yeah. um i think you'd end up with quite a cookie cutter ensemble and it's really fun to have a set of people where you know, some are brilliant yeah. and really practiced in the craft and have done it for 10 years and other people who are yeah. naturally very capable, but actually have a completely different skill set. And yeah. I'm sure that, for instance, Eddie won't mind me saying, Eddie, Eddie, we didn't, and we completely forgot to invite him to audition for the second candidate job when Tim was leaving. We just like, he, he was trying to be a lawyer, but he was, he was a trainee lawyer at a law firm and uh, no one thought of him. I'd never heard of him. Pat, Pat had sung with him for a year at Cambridge when he'd been a lay clerk at King's. And we suddenly thought, okay, well, why not? Well, let, let's listen to him. I mean, what's the worst thing going to happen? And one, he's musically great, but also because of his slightly different background, he's worked in fundraising, he's been a lawyer. He is extraordinary as a kind of, um, as someone who's able to help us revolutionize our business and like help, um, kind of govern it in a way that really sort of fits mm. the 2020s. And that's, that's really exciting. And I don't think we'd have found that if we just mm. gone for the, for the most obvious kind of choral option. Yeah. 
I, I, I remembered, I mean, just going back many years now, just remembering that those favorites who people said, you've got to have that guy along and they were the favorite for the job. They would come and, and sing in their audition. There'd be so much excitement because you, you've got somebody who you really know is out there and uh, they've got such a great pedigree. And then they come and they just, they just can't fit with the sound. They have the most amazing voices, but they just, they just, they, they don't make the, the group sound any better. And um, no. in a way this, um, and, and I'm sure to a certain extent, it's probably still the case that almost having a blank canvas as a voice, having a, a chameleon voice that can change and, 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 and bend itself around and fit with what's going on and that ability to listen is so, is so apparent immediately yeah. in an audition, isn't it? You suddenly yeah. get, wow, and you can almost feel the excitement. Even if somebody's quite bland, you feel the excitement that they're listening. You suddenly feel that they're listening and there's some hope. And that's a, that's a very, yeah. that's kind of the crux of ensemble singing, isn't it? Yeah, no, exactly. I, um, I think it's very interesting because we, we have a mixture a very much a mixture, as I've said, in, in the group of people who are incredibly highly trained, both as call singers and also as um, kind of singing teachers or, or people who have taken their, their vocal coaching incredibly seriously and done it very diligently for a long time. And then people who barely have done any. And I, I think it's very important to have vocal MOTs to make sure you're not doing anything that's damaging. But actually, I mm. find the balance is really useful to have people who can say, like, actually, no, you need to lower this technically this part of your mouth so the larynx is sitting here so you can do this thing another yeah. person to be like actually don't think about it like that at all if that's not working for you and maybe think about it like this use a completely random analogy and sometimes that unlocks the pathways that previously yeah. were blocked so i think what i love about this group is that it's it's kind of the, the fabric is is a really really complex one which I think it sort of enhances it rather than it just being really, really kind of to continue mm. the analogy, like really, really strong, but identical fibers running all the way mm. through it. Yeah. I, I remember joining, joining the group where some of the, 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 the founding members were, were still in at the time. And I stood next to Simon Carrington for about six, six, seven years. And he, he would often turn to me cause I was fresh out of, out of the guild hall where I'd studied technique and, and I, and he would say, um, Steve, I'm, I'm having a little problem with this. I want anything you suggest. And in, in, in a very humble way, a guy who had been yeah. singing in the world's top, one of the world's top chamber groups for 20 years at that point was asking me, you know, a 21, 22 year old for vocal advice. You know, that was quite, it, 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 it says a lot about that group, you know, that how, yeah. how that this kind of mutual respect, immediate on joining a group. Um, tell, tell us something, Johnny, about how, how that works, the structure of the group, because it's not just a musical entity. It's, it's, a, it's a whole kind of business machine as well, isn't it? It's not just... Yeah. A, tell us something about how, how that people don't know, and this is a lovely insight to, to hear how the work group works. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, we're, from, a, from a professional point of view, it's funny telling you this, of course, because you know all of this already, but it's, it's a partnership. So the, the six of us are equally responsible for the business and everyone is equally responsible from the moment they join. Now, that's, that's not to say that um, kind of everyone, the second they join, kind of tries to completely um, redefine everything that we do. I think people come in and they watch and they listen and then they gradually feel more comfortable suggest things. But when we vote, we vote, you know, it, each person has one vote and there are six votes and it doesn't matter if, um, you know, me and say Bruiser, who's the next longest serving, vote one way and the other four people vote the other way. If, that, if that's yeah. the case, even though their combined tenure is much lower than ours, we're still going to do what they choose because that's in the nature of kind it's of... It's a very humbling experience, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah. I know, you know, it's very interesting as well because there are... I mean, you must have found this as well when people come in with program suggestions with really, for instance, with really kind of bright eyes. Ah, this great yeah. idea. And I've done this so often. 
and people have said, "Oh, we've we've literally done that program three times before." And you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then and but now now exactly the same things happening. It's like, oh no, we can't do that. Now we've literally done that, <laughs> like five years ago. <laughs> Um, and so from a, from a uh, kind of a governance point of view, it is interesting because there's this, this permanent balance or con continuous balance between um, making sure that um, we are listening to the people who have got slightly more experience of what the group has done historically to know what's worked, maybe what hasn't worked and also what's just been done. I mean, like it, on, a, on a practical level, like we don't want to sell the same program five years mm. apart. I mean, like the pre presenters get bored. So people yes. do listen, but also, you know, it, what's, what's really funny when you saying what you were, um, you sort of giving advice to Simon Carrington. One thing I've really enjoyed over the last year and a half, and it isn't necessarily easy because it's, you know, I've been in the group for a decade now and this guy's been in the group for a year and a half, but Nick who stands next to me now, so the current second baritone, we're, we're three weeks apart in age. And yet mm. he joined when I'd been in the group for over eight years. So there's there's a weird thing where he has a tremendous amount of experience, um, but just not not necessarily King Singer's experience, but a huge amount. I mean, he's a real choral veteran. He's done everything and performed with everyone in, in London and, and elsewhere, further afield. Um, and so there's a huge amount I can learn from him. Mm. Um, and I think that within the group, there are also things that he can learn from me. Um, but you have to, you know, it's not like you're in a law firm and I've done eight years, so I have a partner and he's coming in as an associate. No, no, we're, yeah. we're both partners now. And, and that's that that's a brilliant part of the job but also an interesting one um, yeah. um must have been interesting because i've not yet um but i think this happened at least once if not twice in your career i've not had the anything i've not had it happen yet that someone's come and then left within my career um do you know what i mean so i think gabriel yep. would have been one of those people i think nigel sure. probably would have been as well and yep. like that that that's really interesting because there's there's a sense, you know, I, I wonder what the sense is like when you're sitting around people are coming and going, like the group, does it feel more your end because you're so much part of the woodwork? It, it, I mean, you, you've you done one of the longest stints ever, or have we? Yeah, it feels, it feels a little bit strange when people, when that happens, um, when, when there's new blood coming in and you, you stand alongside an existing, it, you know, and then somebody decides that they're going to leave, you know, you always respect, respect that the person has made a decision to, to move on in life or there's a reason yeah. behind that. But there's also a slightly, there's a slight feeling of, of are they jumping ship? Is this something I, I should be doing myself? Or what, what's going yeah. on here? It's slightly odd. Usually there's a time when people, it's right for them to move on. And, and usually there's a feeling of, yeah, thank goodness for that as well. You yeah. know, you know, <laughs> without mentioning any names, but there's always kind of, yeah, that's the right time. Um, and then there's people who decide to leave when they're, they're, they're kind of, their height have been brilliant. And you think, well, why did they do that? And it can have an effect on how the group feels as well at the time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, you, you mentioned Gabriel. You know, at the time when Gabriel decided to leave, we were like, why? <laughs> you're so good at what you do, and we're so good with you. And and it's strange. It's like being in a... Well, we, what we often say, the, the, the case is a little bit like a marriage, isn't yeah. it? You work together, you know each other so well. Um, the, the high emotions, low emotions of, of living this kind of artificial touring life. And then somebody decides to leave. It's like somebody's walked out on you in, in a way. Um, so, you know, the KS is, is so, well, it's unique in the way that it's working as it was, uh, has been, working as six people with this equal say, whether you've been in the group for one, you know, one month or, or 10 years. How, how does it work in rehearsals? How, how how does it work now in rehearsals? How do you how there's presumably there's still no musical director, and that your no. six equals tell us. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the 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 standard process for a rehearsal is is very much you go away, you learn the notes, and then you come to the rehearsal ready to create a performance. And it, it, it varies slightly depending on whether the piece is new for everyone or whether it's new, say, for one person and everyone else knows it very well. Um, if it's the case that everyone knows it very well, bar say the newest member, what we will do initially is just 
kind of get them to the point where they slot into the performance as we've done it for a long period of time. So they're, they're just like, you know, here, here you do this, here you do that, here are these dynamic shifts. Usually we then perform it a couple of times and then we say, okay, right, so we let's let's have a rethink. Is there anything we want to change now that the lineup has shifted and we've got some new ideas probably here to bring to this piece of music? Um, and there is no leader. There is no one person in the rehearsal who um, kind of decides this is what we're going to do here. We do have, Nick is the person who actually does plan our rehearsal. So we do know what we're trying, we're meant to get through at a rehearsal, which is helpful. We don't always manage it, but we, we do try to have a, a kind of schedule. Um, and the way it tends to work is that people change on the things they have a particular expertise in. So with me, it might be languages. With someone like Pat, he's a real geek when it comes to Renaissance music. Uh, certainly I have opinions on like, you know, dynamics or colors, whatever. I, that's, that, that feels pretty normal. Eh? That's part of kind of the blood, mm. uh, sort of in the lifeblood of, of what we do. But we, yeah, we do kind of defer to the people who really know about certain things. You know, and again, I, you know, if there, if there are technical challenges about should this be in one voice or another, we might defer to someone who has a bit more technical expertise. Um, but it, it, it's so much talking. Mm. And, and it's funny because I remember this, I remember this when I was shadowing the, the group. Um, so when, I, when I'd been appointed but I wasn't yet singing I was just coming on tour I just sitting in rehearsals and I think by that point by that point I mean someone like you knew timepiece unbearably well probably and, and yet I remember you rehearsing timepiece with Tim in a church in Germany and there was I mean possibly zero singing there was zero singing when you were discussing the piece it's like well here mm. just make let's do this more let's do this more and it does feel strange um because normally, obviously, in a choral rehearsal, you spend a lot of time singing. And I think that's to kind of figure out how the voices sit with each other. And that is the, mm. great, the great privilege of being in a group where the membership is, I mean, not constant in eternity, but I mean, like, constant for a long period of time. So mm. we don't, you don't necessarily need to, to, to work out what it will feel like to sing this note with that person or with those people, because you sing next mm. to those people in exactly that formation all the time, which is why I think you can afford to have so much talking and so much kind of... It's, uh, thinking as opposed to loads of singing in rehearsals. Something I've always found um, interesting about this process, and yes, when people come to rehearsals, I'm, I'm sure you still open, if, you know, particularly in, in North America, uh, being on tour, you'll suddenly have a request from a high school or a university chamber choir to come and sit in on rehearsal, and they'll discreetly sit at the back of the auditorium. Yeah. You're, you're kind of aware, but they're always quite quite surprised you know they might come to the concert in the evening and they'll say oh surprised you don't you don't really do much singing in your rehearsals and um yeah. it is it's that it's that um it's that leveling of the player field it's that kind of mutual respect listening to everybody's ideas you know talking endlessly about the last two bars of a piece and where to place a chord <laughs> and then so trying it yeah. and then somebody say no let's not let's do it how we did it last night and it's taken 10 minutes that wouldn't be an efficient use of a rehearsal, a choral rehearsal with a director. All those <laughs> things get, no, it wouldn't. But it's so instrumental in a group that has to walk on stage as six individuals coming together as one with a joint responsibility and a joint feeling of, a joint feeling of creativity in a way that you feel that you've, you, you have been, you're part of everything that happens on that stage. Yeah, and I think what's interesting, what you mentioned there about the last two bars of a piece, I think is particularly salient. Because, you know, in every concert, things rock. I'm sure this is this has been true for you as well. There's always something that you know, like oh, we could do that better. Um, however, the, 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 the bits like if there is a rocky moment, it's never picked up on by the public. What they say is like, I just have no idea how you come in and come off together. I have, I mean, yeah. the way you the way you breathe, the way that it's just like the ensemble is so perfect. And so those, those 10 minutes thinking about the placing of a final chord are actually the minutes that kind of leave the audience sort of sitting there with their mouths open because they don't know how that's possible. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science. It's because we devote so much time to these kind of minutiae that most directors simply can't do because they have to teach. They require so much in less time and they have less performance opportunity, blah, 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 blah. So I... It, it is infuriating. Like, wouldn't it just be easier if we if we could just have bypassed those ten minutes and yep. someone just said we're doing it this way? 
but you know, one, as you say, it undermines the, the kind of process of a democratic partnership. And two, it, that's what makes us good, I think. And I, I certainly, we, we used to always kind of say we thought, we thought that the, the relatively slow turnover of the group compared to some, some other um, singing chamber groups, um, a cappella groups, was due to this, was the fact that there wasn't a, a one person calling the shots and everybody feeling that they played kind of third fiddle to, to the artistic process. That it, mm. I think that means a lot, not just walking out on stage, but this kind of commitment you give. I mean, you're here 10 years later, um, looking fresh as a daisy. <laughs> um, you know, and I think it, it is, it's a quite, a, it's a very exciting place to create, create business-wise, creativity, musically, you know, all these, it's, it's a very fulfilling, um, it, it takes up a heck of a lot of your personal time. I mean, it, it becomes your life. There's no going to work and then going home. It's, it's very much being kind of on call up here. Um, just tell us about how, how the group, I mean, up until very recently uh, this year, um, the group has an incredibly busy c concert commitment and in between concerts, recordings and all those extra little bits that you try to fit in, as well as learning new music and commissioning and all and the business side of it. How, how, how does the group work through illness, um, bereavements, all of those kind of things? How does that work? Tell us um, a little bit. Well, so I think the group is... is um, now I'm very sympathetic to things like bereavements and, uh, you know, uh, birds and things like that. Um, and in those instances, while people are very good at trying to plan for things like birds, it doesn't necessarily always go to plan. Um, we, we find a way of making it work as five people for a short period of time. Um, we, we, we we're actually in the process now of trying to draw up a kind of an official document which says like what are the processes for kind of paternity leave because it's so important that we have those in place and it happens mm -hmm. so infrequently and none of the six of us have kids at the moment so it's which mm -hmm. is quite unusual it's a very kind of young version of the group mm -hmm. um so with with those things the group is very understanding and we have programs on standby that we can perform as a five um we once did a concert with only four people singing on stage. There were five of us, but one person was miming. I'm not going to say who it was, and it was fine. So I think that it, <laughs> you, you, that it is possible to um, musically survive yep. one person being away. That's not a problem. Um, and particularly for a defined period of time, it, it works. I think what's... Um, Illness is challenging because it manifests itself in very different ways. So I, for mm. instance, I've never missed a concert, but for a lot of last year, I had a, a polyp on my right vocal cord, um, which, which made it quite difficult to sing in the way that I wanted to. Um, so while I was, I was on stage and I was singing all the time, there were lots of mm. moments where like a couple of my colleagues would like take a solo or do something like that. So my voice had a bit more time to recover. Mm. Um, and that's challenging because normally what you would do in those instances is you would get your get the polyp immediately but as soon as possible you get it seen to mm -hmm. and then you'd have full vocal rest and then you then you'd come back and i had to the only time i could do have that operation was at christmas so i had at least eight or nine months with this polyp mm -hmm. um, working out how i could deliver what i need to deliver as a king singer and that that's really tough uh, and i i do find it extraordinary i i we have our as you know we have our archivist manfred in in yep. germany and um i asked him can you, can you tell me how many concerts I've done? Because I have no many, I have no idea how many I've done. He hasn't yet worked out this year because he doesn't have all the information, but he told me that my 1,000th concert was last July, I think, which mm. is wild. I mean, it's sort of mad that I've done that many. Yeah. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that with, with illness, there's, there, there are very few occasions where someone is not on mm. stage. And maybe that's... Um, Maybe that's unwise, but I, I think I mean, this, this is sort of apocryphal and it's also true. I think mm. so much better when someone is, is not well mm. um, because, because the group is like ultra responsive to what's going on within the ensemble and able to adapt incredibly quickly. Um, and yeah. that is amazing to me because people are robots. People are really, really sympathetic and intelligent musicians. They're able to um, 
kind of in in very in a very very short amount of time or quick amount of time able to assess happening around in the ensemble and say i mean occasionally it'll be like i need you to cover me now and it's seven bars time and it's a solo and you think okay i'll do this or it's or it's okay halfway through a concert my voice is completely going we need to completely modify the balance or you need to go and double or something like that and that's exciting that the group has that layer of adaptability um, I, I do remember occasions with um when people various people who were standing next to me also uh, who were who were having going through illness and they wouldn't know until they got to something whether they need something covering or whether it was a double bass yeah. part in some of the early music, a piece like the bomber or something yeah. like yeah. that. But it would it would oops, I think it would merely be a, a flick, a flick of a finger. Yeah. <laughs> it's on a music stand, and that was my sign to go start singing a, a strange part. Um I do remember I I do remember a, a, yeah, you you said that. The, the group senses that the group's art almost goes on to a different level. It's almost a heightened sense of ensemble. It has to work harder at doing the things, at creating the sounds. At, at um, yeah, uh, and actually, what's really galling sometimes for for the person who's ill is afterwards when you go to meet the public. So, uh, the public's often saying that was one of the best concerts they've ever been to. <laughs> where oh, yeah, actually yeah. one of the guys was hardly singing and stood at the back a lot of the time. And um, it does, it makes the group have to really think and um, kind of condense its art in a way, doesn't it? Um, yeah. I was just going to ask you, uh, because as well as the, the kind of stage thing and the, the, the concerts is the, is the recording side. And I just wondered if you'd share with us, perhaps it's recordings you, you, before you joined the group, perhaps recordings that you've made or been instrumental in putting together, but tell us about some of your favorite recordings from the group. Uh, uh, so I probably have, uh, I probably have two from within my time in the group. And then I have quite a lot from before my time in the group. And I think for, for different reasons. Um, from within my time in the group, it was the, the 50th anniversary album and then the most recent one, Finding Harmony, I think, because they are... I mean, Gold was special because it was a, a monumental 17-day recording effort with mm. you know, three discs, and it was trying to trying to do everything that the King Singers have done, really, for the last 50 years. And then it got mm. nominated for a Grammy, which was lovely. Um, but it was, it, you know, as I... I should have said when we were talking about the business side of the thing, each of us is also responsible for different elements of the of the the operation. And while no one does anything in a vacuum, I am I am kind of chief. Um, kind of when it when it comes to all kinds of programming, that's my bag. So whether that's like helping to um, coordinate everyone's thoughts to create a, an offering of programs for a season, or uh -huh. to make sure that we have the best track listing for for an album, whatever. And what the concepts are, and 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 kind of developing all those discussions, is, and that's my remit. I I therefore felt very pleased because that was that was one that um, I put a lot of time and energy into to try and you know like do the group justice, um, but also make it relevant for the world then, and, and that seemed to work. And I think finding harmony is the is a similar thing. It's it's very ambitious because it's there. There are so many different. Um, languages and people we commissioned and um kind of stories from throughout history that need to be honored in the correct way um but you know like us trying to use our platform to elevate all these amazing moments in history where music was at the center of them and i, I think it's worked very well people seem to really like it and I, I i think it's it's really nice to feel like you're doing something that matters so i think from my time in the group much as I've, I've, i've loved recording lots and lots of things those are probably my two favorites I, I, if I think historically, I, I just, my favorite albums are almost some of the weirdest because I, I just, I have so much admiration for the fact that the group will dare to try to do so many different things. So oh. I love, for instance, Spirit Voices because it's so odd that the group did Spirit Voices. Um, you know, it's, it's basically a pop album um, oh. with like synths <laughs> and very like extraordinary levels of mixing and, I, I think it's so cool that a group can create, you know, like an extraordinary album of kind of 16th century Spanish Renaissance music like Silo de Oro, and then mm. also do that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that, that I love. 
And there are so many kind of very early albums that I think are just incredibly special, like Watching the White Wheat. I mean, that's not even that early. That's the 80s, isn't it? But mm. I think when, when you think about like seminal um, a cappella recordings of folk songs, that, that there are no, for me, albums better than that. There are some, there are some wonderful albums by like the Swingles, which, and they do it in a different way. But yeah. actually, like, I, I can't think of anything I would rather listen to. And I frequently play like, Watching the White Wheat around the house, for instance, mm. which, is, which is funny because I, I never really play myself singing around the house. That's a bit weird. But um, those, those I find very special. I think that the mm. last thing I would say, um, the very first album I recorded with the group was about two weeks into my time. Uh, and it was a, a Salvation Army album. Uh, and I know you did, you did the first two in the series and then I did the third mm. one. And one thing which I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to claim that the, 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 say, the arrangements necessarily were, were the, the most, like, kind of musically complex. And like that. It's incredibly simple. Um, and, and, but there's, I think maybe that's what the beauty is. Um, my mother passed away the beginning of last year and at her funeral, there were two tracks played from that first album I recorded as she was walking, mm. as she was being walked <laughs> out, of the, yeah. out of the church. That doesn't make quite as much sense otherwise. Um, and, you know, if you think kind of like that's, we often say this, like, you know, the, the, the real brilliance in, a, in, a, in the vocal ensemble is to be able to do this simple stuff incredibly well. You know, like you Absolutely. just sing with like in, incredibly well balanced chords um, with excellent tuning where no one is standing out. It's very well blended. And no I, place I, to hide. No, exactly. And no I place to hide. And there's mm. something that with, with these two tracks, I think that there was, um, it, it, yeah, everything, everything is just kind of like basic chords, basic cadences. And yet the purity is really, really astounding. So I, I, mm. I would say, I would say that there are a few tracks like that. I think, um, from the, the i mean some we've recorded um recorded so we've performed a lot and i know you recorded them things like um uh what's it called uh to the hills or uh there's a uh twas in the stillness of the night is the christmas one um oh god i wish i could remember what they were called you've recorded them both and we've performed mm. a lot of the christmas and i think it's some of the most sensationally beautiful music mm. that, that exists in our repertoire so i'm going to say that as well well, I mean, j just thinking of a, a, a you know, a, a simple piece by Pretorius that you, the K is probably sing every Christmas. Uh, I don't know if you're, well, presumably you're st st still in the reptiles, is Es ist ein Ross in Sprungen. Yeah. It's just four parts. And so uh, uh, four guys just singing that simple homophony is, is incredibly, it's a, it's a moment of real tension, isn't it? Because, yeah. You, everybody. There's, there's no, there's no, there's no slapstick. There's no, there's no added chords. There's no rhythm and accompaniment. It's just the spotlight is is very bright at that point on on the pure music, isn't it? Um, yeah. Um. So presumably, as you've got your set of favorite highlights of albums, there'll be favorite concert performance memories as well uh, can you tell us about a few of those highlights yeah. in your 10 years that that stick in the memory i think i mean th th there are lots of very obvious ones uh and mm. i'm sure i'm sure you have those too like you know performing performing at carnegie hall for the first time or performing in mm. the sydney opera house or performing uh you know an opera city in tokyo for the first time Th those mm. are amazing things the royal apple hall um I will cherish those moments forever and I'm very mm. grateful I've got to do them. I think what and the real privilege of being in the King Singers is, is that because we're so portable, because there are just six of us, there's no kit, there's no touring, like management touring with us. We often go to places that other people don't go. And I think mm. that those are the moments which I find like perhaps the most profound. Um, so some of the, the memories that will stay with me forever include going to the opera house in Yerevan in Armenia um, mm -hmm. and performing there and no one has any money for tickets. So kind of it, it's, I think it's free for the public, but it was full mm -hmm. people were whooping and cheering forever. It was amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. We went to, we went to Pristina, the capital of Kosovo last year, um, mm -hmm. which was extraordinary. And you think about, you know, like the country is, 
and the cities are still just being rebuilt. You know, I mean, it's it's amazing, and and they now have these like the, the young vocal festivals, and they're they're mm. headed up by very young people, and you think, okay, there's there's energy here. This is exciting. Mm. Um, but then, I mean, just geographically, some extraordinarily weird places, like going up to Yellowknife in, um, which is the, the capital of the Northwest Territories in Canada. It's like a two and a half hour flight north of Calgary. And mm. it's minus 45 Celsius. Yeah. And there are Northern Lights and you can't be outside for more than 10 minutes. And there are, the roads are all just ice roads, which are frozen lakes. Yeah. And, and like that, I, you know, to go to those places as a traveler is extraordinary in and of itself, but because very few people mm. go there as well, the level of appreciation is just enormous. Um, yeah. And so I, I cherish that so much. And I, think I do remember talking it, about yeah. cold places. I remember going to Fairbanks in Alaska. Um, and we, the, on, on that tour, it was a, it was a US tour. We, we, we'd, we'd been to Anchorage and, and we were the first music performance in, 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 in the new art center there. Um, and it was pretty chilly in Anchorage when they, they'd closed the, um, they had, we had to have a very long interval so that people could go out and start their cars. Yeah. Um, yeah. so that they would be able to start because they, they hadn't actually finalized the plug-in system for cars. You know, you plug your car in to keep it heated. And yeah. that, that was the last thing to be done on the work site. But the, so, um, and then we flew up to Anchorage, uh, to Fairbanks and on a little plane. And the guy met us, the presenter, with these Arctic suits and huge animal skin gloves. And we kind of waddled out of the airport. The airport in the middle had a polar bear in a, in a glass case. And on that same trip, I think we flew down to Victoria, Texas, where the presenter met yeah. us and said... Um, so this was after... Uh, who, uh, he met us and it was kind of 80 degrees... And the guy said, you're, you're lucky, the rodeo's in town. And the presenter had a, had a car with cow horns on the front. You know, <laughs> this kind of, and it's funny, you, re, you remember certain concerts, not from their grandeur, not from the fact that there were, you know, a lot of people in the concert. I remember in Salt Lake City doing a Christmas four nights and we sang to a hundred thousand people or something ridiculous because it was in the in the big center yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in in the you don't you don't remember it's the it's the little ones um yeah one concert in particular which was very humbling for the group um was in a little place i think it was and and, and i'm sure italians will write in and and oh, oh, it was a little place i think called erice and when we arrived, it was a concert that was paid for by the local community, had their arts fund and, and booked the group. And we turned up and we were in a very small um, lecture theatre, not very much bigger than this room I'm in now. And there was, the stage was about um, 10 centimetres off the ground. And you could, you could, it was, well, it was a little lecture theatre and you could, you could, we had to do our lights ourselves because the, the spotlights were, you could reach them because the yeah. was a low <laughs> ceiling and there was a whiteboard behind. And really strange thing, like our, our, our manager at the time, Julian Newsom, had been off because we were really hungry. They hadn't provided any food, so she went hunting for food for us. And the only thing she could find was one of these big sort of slab pizzas, which she brought back, which, which, we were in this tiny little, it wasn't a dressing room. It was kind of like a, a broom cupboard and it stank the whole place out. And up until five minutes before, we nearly cancelled the concert because there was no, nobody arrived for the concert because the local, the local town was playing football that time. Or there was a, a kind of local derby and nobody came to the concert. And I think in the end... Well, everything happens late in Italy, as you, as you know. So we kind of waited and waited because, you know, you have that secret um, start time, which is always a little bit later than the advertised, well, yeah. about 15, 20 minutes later. And, um, yeah, the, the, um, I think there were 12 people in the end in the audience. And, and we worked out what the local government had, had, had 
given these very expensive tickets to these <laughs> 12 people. Um, but it was a great concert because we had to, we had to try really hard. You know, when you've got loads of people out there and you've got the glamour of a, you're really on edge and before you work out, you have that slight nervousness. When, yeah. when your dressing room is, is smelling of Parmesan pizza and, and, the, and there's nobody out there and it's tw yeah. half an hour late in starting and you're having to do the spotlights with yourself, you know, <laughs> and, and everything's going slightly wrong and, and you've got those very thin wire stands that are rattling around. Yeah, yeah. The stage is not even level. You've got to really put a lot into that to make that concert work. And I think yeah. those kind of um, moments kind of stick in your head, don't they? Well, yeah, I think that's, it's, it's very interesting. I, I, you only get better by doing, as you say, those concerts which are harder. Yeah. And I think that it, it would be, you know, there are certain performers now who will only perform in enormous venues with big feeds with at least 2,000 yeah. people in the audience. And, you know, I love those moments. And those moments yeah. are, are frequent for us. But actually going to, uh, I remember we did a concert in Bermuda. There were like 50 people in the audience or something like that because, because there were like three big events happening on the island that same night. Mm. And they're just like, our concert had come in late and everyone already booked their tickets to the other things. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. like that's, that's when you get better. Do you know what I mean? Like exactly as you say, when you're having to try hard, when you're not being carried by the yeah, the yeah. energy in the room, or just by the excitement for being there. Like I think that that's that's how you hone your craft. Um, yeah, and it means it also means that it doesn't go wrong when you're you're on a big stage. You know, you're on, yeah. you're on stage at the Old Philharmonic in front of two and a half thousand people, and because you've done all that work yeah. in in smaller venues with slightly more challenging audiences, you're able not to have to think about it when you're yeah. on these enormous world stages. So. I, I'm very grateful for them. I should say one more thing, which I, I think this is one of the most moving moments in my King Singer's career. Um, I think it was about seven years ago, we were in Beijing and we were performing the NCPA in Beijing, so the big egg-like concert hall. And mm -hmm. the, the, the Chinese government had arranged for us to do a workshop. I mean, it's sort of nuts because nothing is just arranged by the concert hall. It's sort of everything has to be signed off. And it was, it was in a cathedral. It's called the Wang Fujing Cathedral, right in the center of the city. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you know, like if you go to China, you can't sing anything religious. You, can't, um, you know, there are loads of pieces that can't be performed. Like, you know, the American University can't perform the Messiah, for instance. And we went into this cathedral. And the cathedral is normally locked because it's a rich space in the middle of the city, so no one can go in. So the government had arranged for this to be in the cathedral, and all of the choirs were singing religious music, kind of, you know, like, you know, soupy things by um, Morton Lauritsen or Eric Whitaker. And, it, mm -hmm. like, not only, not only were, like, we crying, but, like, all the choirs were in tears as well because they never got to do this. They were never in this building. They were never singing this music. Mm -hmm. so how, how are we the people that have unlocked this moment? Like, that's... Yeah mad you know yeah. and that 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 kind of thing that kind of opportunity to to give people access to something they otherwise cannot access yeah is just uh, uh johnny things sometimes um happen in concerts don't they um where things are not planned and things go slightly wrong and and sometimes moments of intense concentration can become moments of hilarity and trying to control oneself. Can you tell us about some funny moments that have happened on stage where you've struggled or funny moments that you would have stuck in your memory? So, I mean, it goes without saying, and I'm sorry, this is a bit crass, but <laughs> kind of the, the first, the first rule of being in a small ensemble is that like, farting does distract everyone and like it's a it's a, it's a really <laughs> silly thing because you're it, it's a thing that you sense both um i don't know like nasally and also um hourly like you hear it you smell it but the audience has no idea so that i i find it very hard i i actually i'm the one person who really doesn't corpse because i'm like the audience won't have a clue what's going on here um but that that it they are amazing because you just you see people just kind of like dying at one end of the group and you're like what on earth has <laughs> happened? And I think that's one of the challenges of having you know such a varied diet and that you're provided food in all mm -hmm. of these places all over the world and sometimes food just 
you know, your body doesn't like it quite as much. Sort of thing. No. And, and things happen and, you, you know, we deal with them. But I think that's the first thing. It's like that happens and I sure happen to all performers all the time. But like mastering yeah. the art of disguising when someone has done it is, is key and it's not always successful. Mm. Um, beyond that, I think... The, the, the funniest things are often things that are happening in the audience at the same time. And you're sitting there, you're sort of sat, trying to perform, thinking, what on earth is happening here? You know, like, um, so um, whether, that, you know, <laughs> we, we often, we, you know, if we perform in Florida, for instance, quite often we'll be in concert halls attached to retirement communities. And there'll be people, of course, on breathing machines. I completely people on breathing machines are really important that they're not denied to people however it, it does seem strange to me when they're all in the front row do you know what i mean so the beeping and the, the noises are as loud as possible and they're often very rhythmic and sort of metrical in a way that completely doesn't cohere in the music that you're singing so and and you might be singing something of incredible kind of profundity very quietly yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly in, in every silence there's a kind of beep that kind yeah. of punctuates the room and you think <laughs> what is going on here otherwise it's 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 things like photographers coming up you know you, you you're like we had this recently where bless him there was a man with a limp who was the um an older man who was the um quite a severe one uh journalist for the local newspaper for a, for a festival in germany it was the first concert we'd done since um lockdown began it was in um germany in september and it was in, I think it was something very still, like Deep in My Soul by Elgar. And he had to drag his foot and he dragged his foot all the way up to the front, took his photos very slowly throughout the piece. Mm -hmm. And then only when the piece finished did he walk again down the side. And you just, you can't help but laugh because you think like, why, why then? Yeah. Why then? And why you here? Like I completely, you know, anyway, you, you celebrate people and you, yeah. you, 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 you do not, um, you do not, you do not worry too much about it, but it's it's it is funny because you think like it kind of it, when things are thrown at you just to try and distract you, you think ah, I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't believe. And it, it's, and it, it's uh, usually that tired, yeah. tiredness when you're tired and you're on tour and your and your defenses are slightly down, aren't they? When I I always yeah. remember, especially in Florida, for some reason, hello everybody in Florida, but it seemed to be people had a different culture about what they could do in concerts and especially eating. You'd have yeah. people on the front row who would be passing around kind of not trays of donuts. So that's kind of a slight exaggeration, but they were passing around noisy things that they were opening and uh, oh. the, the hall would be giving out halls cough drops, which are really noisy to open. And, oh, yeah, and I, I think there should literally be a ban on sweets with wrappers in any <laughs> concert. I, like how it's very funny because like obviously it doesn't make a huge amount of noise from a decibel point of view. Like it's not that when we're, you know, we're on the tube and someone does anything, I'm deafened. But concert halls have usually been designed with acoustics in mind so that you can hear things very, very clearly. So yeah. for someone to open a cough drop, which is, is quite like, you know, ASMR gone mad. It's, it's like incredibly, um, <sighs> it's like a particular sound. You, you really can hear it everywhere. And I think like, yeah, you, there are there are moments of applause between every piece where this would be completely undone. down. So please, please just give it to me. Yeah, I, it's, it's actually, yeah. I, just, I have no, coughing, coughing happens all the time. It's a way of life. I mean, like, particularly this year, but coughing, sneezing, look, I can, I can completely understand. We can't help our bodily functions. But like, yeah, cough drops, sweets. That it's again, it's like I, I struggle with popcorn in the cinema, but at least the cinema is super noisy. Like, you know, the yeah. narrator about popcorn is not is not negligible. Like in a concert, it's yeah. so loud. Yeah. And yeah, and then someone drops it and then okay, anyway. Johnny. I, I think the, the yeah. Tell tell us, I mean, there, there's lots of funny moments in concerts and there's there's lots of moments where we, we can't control ourselves. But I mean, going moving on to something that's quite serious now and has been a, a profoundly affected, the, well, the whole world of this year, but just yeah. thinking of the arts, thinking of music, thinking particularly of the King Singers being such a performing group, touching audiences, changing lives, all that sort of thing. Tell us how the group has 
has gone into lockdown, is coming out of lockdown. Tell us what you've been doing, how, how it's affected you as performers. It, it, it goes without saying, probably, that I mean, like most of our through giving concerts. So it has been to have all of them taken away. Um, I mean, a group like ours doesn't really have overheads. We don't have an office space that we use. Yes, we have a management agency, but they, we, it's sort of a, a model where we, we, we're not hugely out of pocket by, by simply existing. What, mm. what has been tough in what we're saying about honing your craft and really kind of knowing what it's like to sing with each other, like y- you can only really do that in person. We've created a huge amount, I say a huge amount, we've created a lot of online material, lots of videos, lots yeah. of tracks, and, and that's been a really positive thing. And I think to, to show that you can still give to the world in a, in a meaningful way is, is really lovely and still do what you love. Um, but it has been very challenging because, you know, with things like teaching, I mean, you must feel the same way. Like, you know, everything we teach is about like being in close physical proximity to other people and, and responding to them in a really human mm-hmm. way, you know, like hearing their breathing, understanding how their bodies are moving, like, you know, working out when you're singing in tune by hearing, you know, as temperance shifts, what, what happens to chords. You, mm-hmm. just, you, simp- you simply can't do that online. So, mm-hmm. or you can't do it online right now. I think there, there's some very positive things that are coming out of this, like, you know, people developing technologies for really good online rehearsals where everyone can sing at the same time. Like that, mm-hmm. I'm really excited about that. At the moment, it doesn't work, but I'm sure it could work in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think for us, I mean, it's, it's given us, I mean, one, on a personal level, I've really enjoyed not traveling the whole time. Uh, mm-hmm. And what, I think it's it's been probably 25 years since I've had this many consecutive nights in the same bed, um, mm-hmm. which is great, you know, not moving between, you know, homes or um, going off to school or various other things or being at university. Like it's, it's mm-hmm. been lovely to have a sense of grounding and, and it's made me look forward even more to touring again. And it's also, you know, it, it, it's given a new luster to two performing in front of an audience. When we did this concert, or these, we actually did two concerts an hour long each because we, mm. um, we you know, the audience has to shift halfway through in order for the presenter to be able to make their money. Um, you know, all of us just came off stage feeling so invigorated by the fact that there yeah. were real people connecting to you when you're performing. And I think we're all so excited to do that again in, in, a, in a really kind of galvanized way because it's been a while since we've been able to do it. So I think it's... It's tough, and what's what's hard is that we don't know. I mean, I think what we do is not necessarily the most affected because there are at least only six of us on stage. I think if you if you um, you know, I can think of companies that specialize in arranging concerts for choirs of four hundred. I mean, like that's yeah. going to be really tough. But you know, for it, we don't know when it will be that kind of a normal diary resumes, and I think that's very hard for you know from a from a professional point of view, it's hard to plan when you don't know things like sure. income and stuff. Um, but I think the group has, like on balance, I think it really has grown over the last seven months. Um, mm. uh, and, and you know, it, I think if we, if we get too far into 2021 and we're not performing again, it'll be very, you know, I, 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 I do worry slightly about like, you know, what... Do we do we still have the momentum that we need to, mm. to 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 really feel like there is a future? And of course, the King Singers are going to stay together, and of course, mm. no one's doing anything else. But you know, I think that th- th- that taste of doing life before me again is something that we we do gradually need to get back yeah. again. Um, but I, I mean, it's I in, interesting, interesting what you say about going to a small church in Germany and and how special, and you 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 approach that with such excitement and it just feels so wow to be doing it um yeah because when when one does 100 120 concerts a year and you haven't been home for enough nights in a month the concerts can become you know yeah. we do our job and we're professionals but they can they they don't have the glamour of you know it's like seeing your family after lockdown and you know i haven't seen my children all year I'm, I, I was looking forward to seeing them at Christmas and, and it, they're in London now. When we see each other, it will be very special. And um, one can almost think, you know, when, whenever you do a concert, 
you, you're usually seeing people who you know. There are yeah. fans. There are people who always come to your concerts. They're part of your life in a way. They, they're kind of Kings and his family, aren't they? They, they, yeah. they come and they're very loyal. Kings and his fans are very loyal. Um, it's strange not having that element at the moment. Um, you've got a great online presence and, and it's lovely to see people who post things regularly on, on behalf of the group and the supporters who, who have their Facebook pages. Um, it's lovely to see the legacy of the group and, and it's good to know that you're rising to the challenges. Um, I mean, you are doing, you are, you have been using technology. Tell, me, tell us a f about some of the kind of tech learning curves you've had this year because you you've been doing an online series haven't you yeah so so there are there are two things there's, there's recording at home and then there's creating concerts which are kind of viable online concerts and i think there are challenges with both um mm -hmm. you know recording at home we each have microphones and pop shields and we we record our own parts often mm -hmm. along to a live recording of a track that we've mm -hmm. recorded in in recent history so it's, it's us and it feels organic Mm. That's then sent off to um, someone who kind of edits and puts them together. Mm. And then you create a track that way. And so it's a very different process. And to me, it, it does lose yeah, the magic of creating something together in a room. But it's still, mm. it's still music that's been created during lockdown and that's special. Sure. Um, the concert giving thing is interesting because it, for me, concerts are so, they're, they're temporal and they're spatial and their, their shared experiences with other people. Um, mm. You know, like uh, concerts tend to be in the evening. They, they, the, the room you're in watching the concert is sort of part of the performance. Mm -hmm. And um, you're there, often there with people with whom you want to share that moment. And it's interesting kind of redefining what a concert is on the online, in the online space because you're, you're, of course, you're still trying to present your music in a space that reflects the, the repertoire you're singing, but the audience isn't in the space with you. You're not responding to them from the stage and giving them exactly what you feel they want in that particular moment because you can't see their faces. Um, and also it can be watched at any time. So like it, it, it's, you're not relying on this kind of shared moment of everyone doing something at the same time in order for mm -hmm. it to feel of heightened importance. Um, and so that in it's sort of, to those degrees, it's very difficult. I think to create something that really feels like a a proper uh, like a proper concert as we've known it before. Mm. However, I think what what we lose perhaps in those respects, we gain in being able to share music with people and like actual concerts, not not just single music videos, with people all over the world who normally don't have access. You know. Mm. I've been, I've been to Pristina once. I've been to Yerevan once. I've been to Yellow Life once. There are plenty of places I've never been to at all. You know, and those people can now see real concerts, kind of curated concerts with announcements, kind of with flow um, from their living rooms. And, and that allows a different kind of connection. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one that we will continue to try and foster as we come out of lockdown and we start doing live concerts again. I think we, yeah. we, there's a kind of a mandate now that like, the global community is is more accessible yeah. and um, potentially more valuable than we've realized before. And so there is, I think, not just an obligation, but also a, a real opportunity there to um, kind of connect with more people in a more profound way. So yeah. I, I, it's, it is interesting because, you know, from a financial, it's a completely different, think from a financial point of view like we're taking on the risk we're creating something we don't know what the income is going to be whereas when we normally do a concert sure. a presenter pays a fee they take on the risk we know what our income is going to be for however long yeah that, that's that's a bit of a shift mentally but i while while all the things i said before about um the challenges of, of not being with an audience completely kind of still obtain i think that there is there is a future for a real future for, for virtual concert giving and going that mm. I think we all will. I think as long as there is continued momentum, once lockdown lifts to keep doing it, I think people will suddenly, um, be, be, it, it, it will be a culture that, that kind of yeah. grows and, and also therefore becomes better. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the, I think particularly as we kind of 
enter the world of virtual reality where you might be able to put on your headset and sort of be in a room with the acoustics um, yeah. and, and sort of with imaginary people sort of next to you mm -hmm. watching a concert. I think that's yeah. a really, really exciting um, kind of possibility for the not too yeah. distant future. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really grateful for the time You've, you, you've given to chat through. We, we've, we've been here for a long time and um, yeah, yeah. We've covered all sorts of stuff. It's been great to hear. I, I, I know that the group, from my own experience and, and from hearing of the group before I, I joined it, um, that when, it, when there are periods of instability, challenges, the, the group does grow. Um, and the group, of, group of, evolves and you have each other. Um, um, I, I wish you all the best. Um, Thank for you. the months ahead, um, I think you're doing great jobs keeping it all alive. It's um, it's uh, it's a it's a wonderful thing that you do, and um, and I'm, what will be interesting is is um, is to see where this concept, the virtual con, because as you say, um, necessity is the mother of invention. Well, pe people are working on different things right now, and I'm sure you guys will be at the cutting edge of using new technology and, um, and, 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 and getting things to work. Um, well, we're all looking forward to hearing you live at some point. Well, I hope so too. Yeah. <laughs> we're looking forward to seeing hey, you again. Johnny, thanks ever so much uh, for Lovely the time. And congratulations again. A decade is a very long time. Oh, somehow we're still here. I've, I've got one last question for you. Do you remember, yeah. do you remember where you were 10 years into... 10 years into your King's Singers career? No, when would that have been? 1997? Uh, I'm Paul not sure. Paul was just joining, maybe? I, I think no, Gabriel, it... Gabriel had just joined. Yeah. Philip had moved up a part. Yeah. And Bruce had left to become a priest. But as far as <laughs> fine details, um, yeah. <laughs> it was a very interesting time, yeah. Very interesting yeah. time, part swaps, learning to make new sounds, all that sort of thing. But uh, change, change was always uh, seen as a positive thing. It was sometimes a little bit of an upheaval, you know, because you know somebody leaving kind of causes the unsettled. But changes were embraced as moments of growth, I think. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't. I, I don't remember too much about 1997, but. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it was a good one. <laughs> and it was a brilliant year. Don't worry. I, I, I have it in memory as well. Let's have a catch day. up again soon. And, I'd um, love to. and um, thank you again uh, for, for taking the time. Thank you. Have a yeah. lovely day. Bye. See you. Bye. See you. Bye.